It might be hard to believe, but this peaceful, not particularly attractive and very muddy tidal inlet was once a bustling dock. At its peak, hundreds of boats per year would dock here, carrying a wide range of cargo. Join me to explore what remains today as we have a grand tour of Flint Dock. The North Wales town of Flint is one of a string of settlements which over hundreds of years were established along the banks of the River Dee estuary. The whole area is perhaps best described as industrial and even today is home to hundreds of companies who manufacture and process things. The ground below is rich in minerals with all manner of things such as iron and lead ores, coal and limestone. When first built in the 1700s, the dock was used for exporting lead from the nearby Holkin Mountain. Locally, lead was an important industry since times before even the Romans arrived in Britain. Other industries began to spring up alongside the dock. It wasn't long before boat building yards arrived, and of course, a timber yard. Soon, the dock was also exporting coal from the Flint Marsh Colliery, which was located beside the dock. Just behind us, there was a lead smelting works. There were several more collieries nearby, which meant that an extensive tramway system was built to link the collieries and the dock. In those days, the rolling stock would have been similar in shape and size to these, or perhaps this. The wagons would be pushed by men or pulled by horses. I found a small section of tramway which still exists today on a private access road. The dock was built on an inlet from the tidal River Dee estuary. The tidal range is large and dynamic. The largest ships carrying goods to and from distant places would arrive here where loading and offloading was easy in this sheltered location. But before being able to return to the seas, the ships would have to wait, often many hours, for sufficient wind and a high enough tide for them to be carried back out to sea. Cargo would have needed to be transported locally along the estuary. For this purpose, specialist boats were built. They were known as Flint Flats. However, please be sure not to mix these up with these high-rise buildings which are also known locally as Flint Flats. Surprisingly, an example of a Flint Flat boat still exists today. It can be seen from a distance at the Duke of Lancaster Funship, where it has been abandoned. The Flint Flats were more like a barge than a boat. They were wide, with flat bottoms, which allowed them to travel across much shallower waters. Whilst the lead industry had always been important locally, it was a very volatile industry. The value of lead was variable, and the work of extracting the lead ore from deep underground was difficult. Lead miners were paid very low wages and lived in poverty. In 1778, there was severe hardship and food shortages. In frustration of their plight, a group of local lead miners boarded and took over a ship which was about to leave Flint Dock. The ship was exporting grain from the area and the miners felt that stopping the much needed grain from leaving the area seemed the right thing to do to combat the shortage of food which was mainly of bread. In the mid 1800s the lead smelting works closed down. The factory was converted into a huge chemical works said to be one of the most extensive works of the kind in the world. The chemical works produced alkali which was used to make bleaching powder, disinfectant and soap. Alkali was also an important product used in the manufacture of textiles and glass. Alkali works were notorious for pollution 
especially hydrochloric acid gases. This would have been a dirty, smelly, noxious and dangerous place to be. Indeed, the owner of the Alkali Works, James Muspratt, had opened the works here only as a result of being hounded out of his earlier Alkali Works in the northwest of England. In short, Muspratt stopped poisoning the people of Liverpool and came here to poison the people of Flintshire instead. Nice. Later, after the Alkali Works had been closed down, the site was taken over by Courtaulds to build a textile factory. It was an ideal geographical location. A reliable source of water was available, coal could be brought in from nearby collieries, and wood pulp could be brought from the company's own forests in southern Africa. One of the biggest factors in the inevitable decline of Flint Dock was doubtless the arrival of the railway in 1848. This enabled industry to take advantage of a more reliable and much faster transport system for the import of raw materials and export of finished products. The local collieries which had been exporting their coal from Flint Dock were also rapidly declining in the mid-1800s. By the beginning of the 1900s, all the collieries had closed. They had been overpowered by much larger collieries, such as the Point of Air Colliery at Tilacra, which were, of course, served by the railway. Silt was also a huge problem. Flint Dock itself had a system in place to reduce silting of the inlet. A tidal lagoon was located at the head of the dock. This would fill up at high tide. The water from the tidal lagoon, or flushing pond, as they were called, would be released at low tide. This process would flush the silt out of the Flint Dock. I found these two interesting columns at the head of Flint Dock. They were manufactured by Blakeborough Valves of Brighouse, Yorkshire. I assume these would have perhaps been used to operate sluice gates or valves, which would have allowed the control of the water flow in and out of the Flint Dock. The river estuary was also silting up rapidly. Further upstream, the routing of the River Dee between Connors Quay and Chester had been altered in the 1730s. The river had been diverted into an artificial channel. The work of canalising was planned and undertaken by engineers from the Netherlands and paid for by Chester Corporation. This altered the flow patterns of the water in the wide and shallow estuary. Additionally, extensive dredging works of the River Mersey were carried out to develop the port of Liverpool. The sand which was dredged was dumped further out to sea in Liverpool Bay. Unfortunately, the ever-changing sea moved much of this sand and dumped it in the River Dee estuary, sealing the fate of the many docks which once lined the Dee. Flint Dock did put up a fight though and continued serving the local businesses. Whilst researching I found a photo showing the dock still being active in 1928. Today the dock is abandoned and nature is taking over the quaysides and mud banks which are a haven for wildlife. Trees are reclaiming land which was once the place of industrial activity. The dock is a place where local people walk their dogs. Long distance ramblers pass around the dock, which now lies on the route of the long distance Wales Coast Path. Attempts are ongoing to improve the area with clearer footpaths and signposts. Of particular note is this collection of stones at the head of Flint Dock. If you look carefully, squint and apply some imagination, the stones are arranged in the shape of a ship. There are another two of these arrangements halfway down the inlet. Ship shape arrangements of stones are commonplace in Scandinavia where they were built in the Viking Age. Megalithic ships were built as burial places or funerary monuments. 
The old industrial scars may be fading away from the dock itself, but nearby the town of Flint is still a major industrial centre for manufacturing and processing. The railway has declined. The sidings and good yards have long since closed due to our modern-day obsession with transporting goods by road. If you would like to visit Flint Dock, it's close to Flint Castle, but it is a little tricky to find. You need to follow this road over the railway from Flint Town Centre. Be wary if you are following a sat-nav which tries to take you down this other route under the railway, especially if you are in a taller vehicle. Well, that's all for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed this grand tour of Flint Dock. If you have, please remember to like, subscribe and perhaps even leave a comment. It's now time for me to say goodbye, farewell, Will Vower, and of course, have a grand tour! <laughs>